In this video, we're going to go over a couple of examples of actual IR spectra and learn how to use a IR correlation table to match the peaks in the table to the peaks that show up in an actual IR spectrum. So let's just go over a couple of more rules about IR spectra and let's start by looking at an anhydride. So anhydrides, it says here, have two modes of vibration. On the next slide, I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. But first, let's look at the IR spectrum here on the screen and talk about the next two statements. It says here that anhydrides have two modes of vibration. Now, when I'm referring to that, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the carbonyl, the carbon oxygen double bond vibration of an anhydride. So let's remind ourselves, what is an anhydride? Well, an anhydride is if you take two carboxylic acids and dehydrate them, as shown on the screen here, so this would be acetic anhydride. It's two molecules of acetic acid that have uh, come together and been dehydrated. Okay. Now, when I'm talking about anhydrides having two modes of vibration, we have two carbonyls. Okay. Now, each of the carbonyls Remember, the starting ballpark place for carbonyl vibration is about 1710, 1715 wave numbers. So, number one, in an anhydride, that carbonyl should be blue shifted. It should go to a higher frequency. Why? Because the carbonyl has a very electronegative oxygen attached to the carbonyl carbon. Because it's electronegative, it's pulling on the electrons in the carbonyl bond, and so that carbonyl bond is pulled in shorter tighter and vibrates at a higher frequency. So that's why anhydrides are blue shifting and go much higher than 1710, 1715 wave numbers in the IR spectrum. But that's only one way to identify anhydrides is by the blue shifting of the carbonyl. Another way to identify anhydrides is that, as it says on the screen, there are two modes of vibration. Why is that? Well, we saw this in a previous video where we can have symmetrical and asymmetrical stretching vibrations. So, if both carbonyls in the anhydride are vibrating in sync symmetrically with each other, that's going to give rise to one dipole moment and one carbonyl vibration, one peak in the IR spectrum. But the two carbonyls can also vibrate asymmetrically out of sync with each other. That gives rise to a different dipole moment. And so anhydrides have a double fang for the carbonyl, one for the symmetrical stretch, one for the asymmetrical stretch. You also see this in amines. Remember, an amine is when you have a nitrogen, and if it's a primary amine, like I've just drawn on the screen here with an NH2, then again, there are two modes of vibration. If you have an NH2, there's going to be a symmetrical vibration for the stretching vibrations NH, and then there's going to be an asymmetrical NH vibration. And so that gives rise to a set of double fangs, okay? And so we see this actually on the screen here in this example IR spectrum. This is actually an amide, not an amine, but it has the NH2 functional group in it. And so you see here at around 3300, that characteristic double fang that tells you it's an NH2. And then also look at the broadening, right? You see broadening of each of those peaks in the double fang. The broadening is due to a high degree of hydrogen bonding that is present. So on the screen, why does it say that secondary means only have one mode of vibration for the NH vibration? Well, because if you are a secondary amine, so let's remind ourselves what that is. So we'll put two R groups on our amine. Well, now there is only one hydrogen. So if there is only one hydrogen, it makes perfect sense that there should only be one NH stretching vibration. Um, and again, when you see that one NH stretching vibration for a secondary amine, keep in mind, look for the broadening of hydrogen bonding, and that'll be another clue that what you're looking at is a secondary amine. So here's the anhydride. And why do anhydrides have two modes of vibration? And by this, I mean two modes of vibration for the carbonyls, okay? Now remember, 
a carbonyl vibration should be in a starting ballpark place around 1710, 1715 wave numbers. On an anhydride, that is actually going to be blue shifted to a higher frequency, a higher note. Why? Well, if you look at what you have on the screen here, remember for the anhydride, if you have an oxygen in the middle here, okay, an oxygen being one of the most electronegative elements in the periodic table, what that electronegative oxygen is doing is pulling on the electrons in the carbonyl double bond. And so if it's pulling on those electrons because it's so electronegative, that's going to shorten the carbonyl bond. It's going to be tighter. It's going to vibrate at a higher frequency. And so that's why you see anhydrides are blue shifted. Okay. Now, so that's one thing we can see here is that the carbonyls for the anhydride are going to be blue shifted well above 1715 wave numbers. But the other important thing is that anhydrides actually have two carbonyl peaks. It kind of looks like a little bit of a, a double fang. Why is that? Well, because when I say we have two modes of vibration, we can have the symmetrical vibration where the carbonyls are vibrating in sync. That's one dipole moment. And then we can have the asymmetrical anhydride vibration where they're vibrating out of sync. That's a slightly different dipole moment. So look for the double fang for anhydrides when you're looking at the carbonyl peak. Now, this chart, should you memorize the entire chart? I don't think so. I don't have the chart memorized. I do remember where things are in the chart, and that's just because of lots of practice. So I think the best way to get practice at interpreting IR spectra is to go to a database, look up example after example after example of IR spectra, have your chart with you, and just use your chart to interpret the IR spectra. It's not cheating, but if you spend enough time looking at the chart and identifying the notes in the IR spectrum, how many times are you, for instance, going to have to look at a peak at 1710 in an IR spectrum and then look it up on the chart and remember, oh, it's a carbonyl. How many times are you going to have to do that before it just becomes second nature that, oh, a peak at 1710 that has that shape and it is that big, that means I've got a carbonyl in my molecule. I don't think it's going to take too many times. And so for me, looking at IR spectra is almost sort of like, uh, like uh, picture recognition, facial recognition, where I'm looking at um, the IR spectrum, and I just sort of kind of get a sense for what are those notes, what are those peaks, and I don't have to first sit down and memorize the entire chart. I think one of the best databases for doing this it is what is known as the SDBS database. It's a uh, free database open to anyone. The web link for the database is on the screen here. It's also linked under external links in your class Blackboard site. And if you go to the SDBS database, it's a wonderful resource for looking up examples of IR spectra and practicing your interpretation skills.